Betsy family, and welcome again to the Ghost Light series. Today we will be providing uh, some wonderful entertainment in the form of one of our Ghost Light readings. Today's play is called Bone Records, and I'm very excited to introduce the playwright, as she is one of our key members of the Betsy family and a longtime member of our staff. Please welcome Heather Beasley. Hi, I'm Heather Beasley. I am the playwright for Bone Records, which so far um, it was started at the 2018 National Winter Playwrights Retreat. And it has since received a reading at the Skate Park Festival in 2019. This May, it will be part of the Playwrights Voice Festival and it will receive a full professional production in February 21 at Relative Theatrics in Laramie, Wyoming. Um, I'd love to give the, the cast the chance to introduce themselves this morning and tell you who they'll be playing. Hi, I'm Erica Mori, and I'll be playing Tazia Olation. Hello, I'm Peter Bussian, and I'm going to be playing Anton Agorkin. Hi, my name is Chris Kendall. I'll be playing Inspector Morozov and also Vladimir Babushkin. Hi, my name is Runner Francisco, and I'll be playing Moritz Sokolov. Hi, I'm Rebecca Vermaley, and I'll be playing Svetla Kapakova. And my name is Luke Sorge, and I'll be reading Stage Directions. Bone Records by Heather A. Beasley. Act One, Soviet Interrogation Room, Fall 1956. Shaft of light on a small metal table and chair. A man in handcuffs is pushed onto the chair. His face is bruised on one side. State your name? Anton Agorkin. What is your profession? I'm a doctor. What were you doing in the vicinity of Zagorodny Prospect this evening? I was out for a walk. Just out for a walk? Long walks help me think. And what were you thinking about? A problem at work. And where do you work, Dr. Igorikin? The Marinsky Hospital. Your long walk took you a long way from there. Did you see anything unusual tonight? Yes, I did. What did you see? A young man ran past me in the darkness, then two more men chasing him. How do you know it was a young man? He was running fast, but he wasn't breathing hard. He was almost right behind me before I heard him. He, he surprised me. I guess he was young. I, I don't know. I, I didn't see him well. It was dark. Were the other two close behind him? Not really. No. Did you try to stop them? No. Were you trying to slow them down? No. The first man smashed me sideways into the pavement. By the time I pulled myself together, I heard police whistles. Then I was brought here. I, I didn't do anything. Why did you arrest me? Those men were chasing a dangerous criminal. He escaped because they lost track of him. They lost track of him because you slowed them down. Now you understand why you are here. You appear to be a an accomplice to a crime, doctor. What crime? That's what we're here to find out. Dr. Rigorikin, do you know the name Vladimir Babushkin? No, I don't. What about Moritz Sokolov? That one sounds familiar. I, let me think. I, yes, I, I went to school with a boy by that name a long time ago. Tell me, how did you meet? Blackout. A door slams in the darkness. 1948. Lights up on a kitchen with a small table. Tazia sits on the floor, out of breath. There is a cardboard shoebox on the table with a rock on top of it. Something's moving inside. We can hear it and see the box shake. I know you're there. Go away. What are you going to do with it? None of your business. Let me in, please. Give me one good reason why. I help take care of the birds at the Leningrad Zoo. She brings Anton into the kitchen. I saw you at the park. I was going to... I was going to doesn't stop anyone. I know that. I know you from somewhere. Oh, I've, I've seen you at Komsomol Assembly. Anton Agorikin. Tasha Olishin. 
Do you know something about birds? I've been cared for them before. How did you learn to do that? My father is a veterinarian. I have watched him work. How do you heal one? Well, I need to know what's wrong with it first. It might have a broken wing. You won't hurt her. Setting a broken bone hurts, so I might hurt it, but I'll try not to. Anton opens the box lid partway. The box moves. They jump. Anton slams the lid shut. What do we do now? Wait. The bird will stop moving when it gets too tired. Then I can take a look. How long will that take? I can take it with me if you want. I saved her. I want to know what happens to her. What if it's them? Tazia right. re-enters with Moritz. It's all right. He's just here for our lesson. We're still meeting today for math review, right? What's going on? Tazia saved a bird from a pack of boys who were beating it with a baseball bat in the schoolyard. Come in. Anton Igorkin, Moritz Sokolov. We go to the same school. Of course, I've seen you around. Did you bring the bird with you? Where is it? Will you hold it while I take a look? Sure. I wrapped her in a dish towel when I brought her home. Not too tightly. I thought it would be like a nest. Moritz puts his hands into the box and grasps the bird. Easy now. He holds the bird still. Anton runs his fingers along the wings. I think the right one's broken. No easy way to fix that. He puts it gently back in the box. So what can we do? Splint it. Shoot it. No! Splint won't work. It won't stay on. Even if you could make one fit. I could tape it up instead, bind the broken wing against its body, but it will take weeks to heal. It won't be able to fly with the tape on. It will have to be caged. The bird won't know it has to heal. It will beat itself to death against the cage. You would rather just kill her? It's faster, less painful, merciful even. <sighs> There's no way to know without trying. It could just be a hairline fracture. So it could heal completely. Or it could never heal at all. I didn't bring her home so that you could- But what if he's right and the bird hurts itself worse? It's not like we keep a gun in- Moritz pulls out a pistol from his satchel. Where did you get that? I was doing some business for my uncle. He gave it to me in case I needed it. What kind of business? None and of you, your business. And you brought it today. Why? I had to run an errand for him on my way here, so I brought it along. The box moves. The three of them stare at it. The box moves again. Moritz shoots the box. Silence. They wait. It does not move. Anton opens what's left of the box lid. The box moves. Jesus. I don't know how I could have missed from that range. How could you? I don't want to stand here arguing while it's dying. It's Tazia's bird. Tazia, what do you want? I wanted those boys to leave her alone. I wanted her to have a chance to live. I wanted her to fly again. We don't know if that can happen, but the best we can do is try. She offers the box to Anton. He takes it. I'll take care of it. I'll take it to my father. Comrade Alation? Anton leaves. Lights down. Tazia's office. Fall, 1956. Undersecretary Alation, you wanted to see me? Deputy Kabakova, come in. I understand you are assembling the documents required to be considered for promotion, yes? Yes, comrade. You seek to be promoted into my position. I am planning ahead for when you receive promotion, under Secretary Olation. You have risen fast through the ranks. Then we will work together to rise together. Yes, Deputy? Given our ministry's activities within the past 24 hours and the increased number of arrests, I expect a number of unusual and urgent needs today. Are you open to taking on tasks outside your current job description? I am. Excellent. I will keep that in mind in assigning duties and reviewing your portfolio. Next, did you receive any phone calls this morning? None, why? I need you to survey all internal affairs staff on our floor this morning. It seems calls and messages are not going to their intended receivers. It could hardly be news that our phone system is unreliable. <laughs> it may not be news, but now it's our problem to solve. I will ask if they have received expected messages within the past day and report back. Thank you. Now, what forms have we received since yesterday? 
As you know, multiple arrests were made last night. These intake forms just came in. How many of the men on this list are now in custody, according to your forms? Was our informant detained? No, they didn't arrest Sokolov. Then we must find him before the gangsters do, or they will silence him permanently before he can testify. Understood. The rest of the names match up, but this one isn't on your list. Anton and Gorigan? In connection with the Babushkin case? That information cannot be correct. It says here he's a medical doctor, a very well-connected member of the party. The report suggests he was delaying pursuit. Whose report is this? That information has been redacted from the copy of the intake report we received. Let me see it. He was clearly detained by mistake. He was walking through the neighborhood where our raid was planned when the secret police literally tripped over him. A disappointing incompetence. Nonetheless. Is the doctor still in detention? Yes, comrade. Find out who's in charge of his interrogation and report back. Svetla leaves. Best thing to do is keep on like normal. Nothing unusual ever happened. Calm, cool, collected. Tazi returns to the kitchen. 1948. Maritz, you should go too. Anton's gone. So is the bird. So there's nothing to see here. He puts the gun back in his satchel. The best thing to do is keep on like normal. Like nothing unusual ever happened. Firing a gun inside our apartment. Honestly, I could... What about our lesson? You know, university placement exams are next Tuesday, and I don't understand the first... We day. could all be arrested. Are your neighbors home? Will they tell? I don't know. You have nothing to hide. That noise could have been anything. But it still smells like gunpowder in here. Perhaps a car backfired outside. Sure. If your neighbors come, or the police, there's no evidence of any wrongdoing. Just stay calm, cool, collected. Then give them a plausible explanation. That's our game plan. And what if no one comes? Then we'll go on with my lesson. He takes a textbook and notebook from his satchel. Besides, let's just stay here for a while, just in case there's any trouble. He pulls a second book from his bag. And I brought you something um, as, as payment for helping me these past three months. Anna Akhmatova, Selected Poems. Where did you get this? From a friend. This couldn't have been easy to find. My friends know where to find things. I can't keep this. It's banned li literature. Sami's that. She hands it back to him. I know you like poetry, Tasha. And I hear Akhmatova is one of the best, the most original. He opens it to a random page and reads, Our feelings then were so much alike, and in the next room the future was still tramping around like a crowd of extras, whispering among themselves and yawning and knowing everything in advance. He holds the book out to her again. You're smart enough to develop your own taste. Look, at, at least read it first, then destroy it if you like, but decide for yourself. Tazia takes it, starts to read. Lights down. Interrogation room, 1956. I met him through a mutual friend in school. She was tutoring him in math. How well did you know him? We were the same year in secondary school. We were in a few classes together. Went close? I took college prep classes. He was a musician. We only had a few general subjects together. What about socially? I was in Comsmol and didn't go out much otherwise. He, he was in a band, not just at school. They played at parties and clubs. He ran with a fast crowd. What instrument did he play? Saxophone, I think. Do you know what he's done since then? No. Wait, uh, I remember. Was he going to trade school? Think harder, Dr. Igorikin. When was the last time you saw him? A school hallway. Anton is reading 17. Moritz enters. Hey, what are you reading? Uh, an assignment for English class. Uh, Madame Lubnikova gave us an article from some American teen magazine to translate because it's in simple words, she says. 
Secrets of a Teenage Model? No. New Attitudes Towards Your World Today. Do you need a new attitude? Probably a new attitude towards English. It doesn't count toward our placements anyway. Have you looked at your exam results yet? I'm afraid to open it. Your scores, you did fine. How do you know that? You're always top of the class, like a straight arrow. Why would it this time be any different? Because this time it matters. Where do you want to go to school? St. Leningrad State University. I've heard it's very hard to get in there. You, you have to be practically perfect in every way. That's why they call it St. Leningrad. I'm going to study medicine. If I'm accepted there, I can stay close to home. My mother's been ill this winter. I, I'd like to have good news for her. So open the envelope. Have you opened yours? No. I'm not in a rush to find out where I'm being sent. My family aren't party members, and I'm no upstanding come small youth. The application process is based on your skills alone. It should assign you to the position that best serves our Soviet motherland. That may or may not be true. I don't think it would, be, it would have mattered if I'd answered every single question correctly. Maurice opens his envelope, pulls out a letter, and reads it. No surprises. Looks like I'm heading to Viborg for trade school. You seem very calm about it. When you already expect the worst, it's only a very small hope that gets crushed. At least I won't disappoint anyone. Well, maybe my mother, Natasia. She was hoping I'd stay closer to home. What trade will you study? Radio mechanics. Why? It's easy to find a job. They pay is good, and I like tinkering with electronic devices, seeing how they work. I would have thought you'd be a musician. After hours, on my own time. Are you going to try and keep the band together after graduation? No. We'd have to save up for instruments, since we have to give ours back to the school. And since I'm not staying in Leningrad, well... That's too bad. Viborg. It could be worse. Cold as a witch is tit that far north. It's almost in Finland. It's an excellent place for a radio mechanic or a jazz musician. You can hear almost anything that close to the border. Voice of America and Radio Free Europe. That Western propaganda. They're just trying to brainwash us. I don't care about their news broadcasts. It's their music. All oh, the jazz I want. Lester Young, Coleman Hawkins, Charlie. Parker. I can hear it all. I heard a rumor at Komsomol that Stalin's going to ban saxophones completely. Well, I won't have an instrument left for him to confiscate. And possibly all public improvisation. Our leader does not appreciate the unpredictable. Speaking of predictability, open your envelope. I want to see if I'm right. You do it. Why? You care less about what's inside. It will bring me good luck. Moritz opens the envelope and reads, saying nothing. What does it say? Oh, oh, sorry. Just imagining a dream of mine coming true thanks to a letter from the state. Probably a nightmare. Congratulations. And welcome to St. Leningrad. Lights down. Interrogation room, 1956. I, I remember now. He was moving to Viborg, something to do with radios. Mm. I have a few more questions for you, doctor. Which secondary school did you attend? Number 197. One moment. Mortsov steps into the hallway with Svetla. You have been asked to report to Internal Affairs. Comrade Zolosov wishes to see you at your earliest convenience. He is waiting for your joint report. I see. What reply shall I deliver in return? Well, I am on my way to see Comrade Oleshin shortly regarding her section of the report. Mortsov returns to the detention room. Svetla stays to eavesdrop. Madame Tasia Oleshin is a friend of yours then, since your youth, another 197 graduate? Comrade Oleshin, yes, I know her. What is your association? We were good friends in school, although she was a year behind me. We once served as Komsomol officers together. We were both on the debate team. Lights down. Komsomol Assembly, 1952. Two lecterns. A center placard or chalkboard with the question, 
What is the Soviet Union's proper relationship with arts and culture of the West? Anton and Tazia stepped to the lecterns with their notes. Resolved. Our obligation as Soviet youth is to create a distinctly Soviet culture. We will accomplish this best by strict controls on the imports of Western cultural goods. Resolved. Our obligation as Soviet youth is to create a vibrant, strong communist culture. We will accomplish this best through mutually beneficial cultural trade relations with the West. We begin in agreement. Artists and cultural laborers must work to achieve the aims of the Communist Party and the Soviet state. Communism is a worldwide movement. Artists in the ideal worker state will be from every nation. But the decadence and decay of Western capitalist culture is obvious. Take this magazine. He holds up the Seventeen magazine from earlier. Such publications create a cult of female appearance. They lead to a shameful passion for pornography among adult men. But in the Soviet Union, our socialist publications encourage perfect equality among the sexes. Our leaders preach perfect equality through re socialist realism, but only a few women have been admitted to the arts, to the artists, writers, and composers unions. Here in Leningrad, women's journals have been shut down. Are these the heroines you would have young women emulate? Models, celebrities, film stars, and pageant queens? At least Western nations recognize that young women contribute to national culture. We can learn from them. Women's voices must be heard. These magazines and their advertising encourage endless consumption. We must protect our youth from the empty promises of capitalism. Cultural exchange helps us to recognize our common humanity, our shared needs. To continue the struggle for the happiness and freedom of the working people, we must first develop culture in the Soviet Union, the homeland of communism. We already know communism is the superior political system. So open cultural exchange will open the doors for Soviet artists to transform the world hand in hand with artists of all nations. A bell rings. Anton and Tazia put down their notes and step away from their podiums. I think you won. I expect that you did. Uh, but the arguments for cultural isolation are so weak. The magazine was a nice touch. <laughs> Something I had left over from high school. I had Madame Lubnia Lubnyakova too. I had Madame Lubnyakova too. I loved those English assignments. Secrets of a Fashion Model was my favorite. Mine too. Do you think today's debate will affect the Komsomol elections? I doubt it. I think most people made up their minds before they came to the meeting. You haven't campaigned much for your office. Don't you want to be treasurer? The only reason I'm running for office is because I thought not many people would be willing to do the work. A Komsomol central committee position is prestigious, in the ministry at least. It shows I'm ready for leadership. And it's a requirement in order to attend the National Congress. Then I wish you the best in today's elections. And the same to you. Lights down. Interrogation room, 1956. So Comrade Oleshin had a soft spot for artists from other countries. That was the position she was assigned to argue during one debate. I am familiar with the Komsomol Debate Society, Doctor. How well do you know her now? We are colleagues. Sometimes we see each other at social occasions. Why does it matter to you? I'll ask the questions, doctor, and I find it interesting that you know both Madame Oleshin and Moritz Sokolov. Very interesting. Lights shift to Tasia's office. Dr. Igorkin has not been released? No. I stayed to listen for a moment. Who is running the interrogation? Conrad Morozov. He was asking the doctor questions about you. About me? About your associations, about how long he'd known you. That is well outside his jurisdiction or the focus of this investigation. You know that Comrade Morozov thinks your methods are un unorthodox. He has argued against them to the committee. He dislikes your network of informants. My network may be unorthodox, but it's usually effective. She scribbles a note. Please take this to the Marinsky Hospital. Deliver it to Dr. Voronin, head of emergency medicine, in person and wait for his reply. It's urgent. Svetla leaves with the note. Interrogation room. Were you unaware that Sokolov had returned to Leningrad to work with his family's business? Now that you mention it, I do remember seeing him at the flea market some time ago. 
Now that I've mentioned it, what was he doing there? He was running a booth like any other, a mix of clothes and music and jewelry and junk. Did you buy anything from him when you saw him? Yes, I did. The Goom Flea Market, on the street, 1953. Moritz is the stall vendor. Anton starts going through the jewelry items on the tables in Moritz's stall. Well, Anton, it's been a while. What brings you to the market today? Uh, I'm here to find something special. It's a graduation present for a friend, but not too romantic. I don't want her get, to get the wrong idea. So, a present for a woman, then? It should be beautiful, but not too expensive, and not too feminine. You know a lot about what you're not looking for. I'm not great at buying gifts. Does she wear a lot of jewelry? Our selection is somewhat limited today. Uh, what else does she like? Uh, music, clothing? Uh, I'm not terribly sure. Does she want to receive a present from you? I haven't given her a... This is the first. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> so you want an item to impress her, but not overwhelm her. Not too expensive, but good quality. That tells her in a subtle way. You think she's special, but a gift that will allow you to save face if she's not interested. That's just the thing. Moritz pulls out a woman's watch, still in its box. Practical, professional, but ornamental, made for a woman's wrist. The metalwork is delicate. That would be perfect. I don't know how you do it. It's my job to discover what people like. 60 rubles. I'll take it. Thanks for your help. Uh, do you have any, do you, do you have further shopping to do today? I, I can hold it for you here if you like. No, no, this is the only thing I need. Anton returns to the interrogation room. What did you buy from him, contraband? No, I, I bought a watch. You shop from his stall regularly? No, I don't spend much time at the markets. Your wife takes care of the shopping then? I'm not married. I live with my father. At your age? Since my mother died last year, he's been in poor health. He moved in with me last spring. What's wrong with him? It's complicated. So the doctor isn't smart enough to figure out his own father's diagnosis? I'm not in custody because I have an ailing father. Tell me why I'm here. You're going to tell me that, doctor. What now? Comrade answers. Comrade Morozov, you're needed immediately in internal affairs. There's been a second arrest. Svetla and Morozov cross to Tazia's office. Lavori Babushkin is in custody. Is that so? Why was I not immediately notified of his arrest last night? No file, no report was filed. I did not authorize his arrest. Every arrest related to cultural affairs, smuggling of contraband, unauthorized performances, production of contraband, passes through this office for documentation and approval. I told you I did not authorize his arrest. You were assigned oversight of last night's raid, aided by information I provided from an inside source. You had a long list of smugglers to arrest. You missed one. This morning, I hear that someone has arrested Babushkin himself, and you know nothing. Where is the paperwork? How should I know? Instead, you are interrogating a man unfortunate enough to be standing near the location where you should have arrested someone else. Dr. Egorikin is lucky to be an associate of yours. He is also an acquaintance of your informant. Did you know that? So are a thousand other people that shop at the Goom Flea Market. It means nothing. So why detain him? Perhaps the doctor has valuable information. Babushkin is a higher priority. I can't turn in a blank report to Comrade Zolotov. Speak with your men and find out what's going on so that I can write it up. Now you can see why every moment of this investigation must be done precisely by the book. He would love to catch me breaking a rule, any rule. Any mistake and- He will seek to have me removed from my position. Every step must go through official channels. Lights down. Goom Flea Market, spring. 1953. Tazia pulls out a Shostakovich album from a box. I see you like Shostakovich's work. Are you looking for his octet? I would be out of luck if I were. Why is that? 
Shostakovich was denounced by the Committee for Artistic Affairs. So that recording is no longer available here or anywhere in Leningrad. That may or may not be true. The octet and several symphonies were removed from the official repertory years ago. This stand is stocked only with works from the official repertory, of course, but many things are unofficially available for a price. I know you from somewhere. You tutored me a few years ago. I needed to brush up my math skills. Maritz, sorry, I didn't expect to see you here. I thought you went to trade school in Viborg. I did, for a few years. Now, though, I work in sales for my uncle. Welcome to his satellite office at Goom Market. And yourself. I'm finishing humanities at Leningrad State this spring. I've just been accepted into a position at the Ministry of Culture, actually. Sincere congratulations. It will be so much better than my current position. Which is? I've been working in the visa office, giving tourists advice about which museums to see and when to go to avoid the longest lines. Sometimes they give me presents. They give you presents? The English language tourist guide suggests small bribes for the local authorities. Clothes, jewelry, records, books. But I turn all those things into the head office. Calm now, Tasia. You were never one to turn down a book, especially poetry. You never kept a single volume? Well, I did keep one of the records. Contraband, comrade. My friend Natalie came to study ballet with Vaganova at the Leningrad Conservatory. While she was here, she had a whirlwind romance with a Ukrainian man she met at the dance halls. He gave her a Pyotr Leshenko record. The song was called Tatiana, and it was so romantic. When they broke up, she gave me the album before she returned to America. That was a present from a friend, then, not a bribe from a tourist. But Leshenko's music is not for sale either. Not in Leningrad. Of course it isn't. And you're so familiar with all these forbidden musicians because... The sound recorder is my uncle's Nikki store. We sell recordings of premier Stalin speeches and of the current state favorite compositions. It is my business to know what we are officially allowed to sell. And if someone were looking for something unofficially? Then that theoretical someone could put in, a put in a request here at the satellite office. With no guarantees and no returns, we cannot be held responsible for the changing tastes of the Committee of Artistic Affairs. I see. Well, I'll take this one. She hands him the Shostakovich album she first pulled from the box. Do you have other shopping to do today? I'm looking for a birthday present for my mother. Perhaps a sweater. My mother likes to shop down the way at Kolya's, especially when she's getting ready for a date, you know, with her boyfriend, Vladimir. Take a look there, why don't you? And let me put aside, let me put this aside for you. You know, you can pick it up on your way back to the shop. That would be very kind. Thank you. A pleasure doing business with you. And good luck finding that sweater. Tazia leaves. Moritz pulls out a box from beneath one of the tables, searches through it, and pulls out a bone record. He writes a brief note on it and slides it inside the album sleeve with the album she bought, then wraps it up. Tazia returns to her office, 1956. Let's begin your debrief. Svetla pulls out a notepad and pen. No notes. Understood. Last night, a raid took place on a major criminal operation. As a result of that raid, Babushkin passed through our ministry's custody, but his arrest has not been properly documented. That's a red flag. As yet, I do not know if he is still in detention status. The only other person who has full access to the planned raid information is Marosov. Because you gave it to him. Precisely. He has the required clearance to authorize the arrest, but you heard him yourself. He seemed genuinely surprised to hear that Babushkin was in custody. You worked in this office, what, now 18 months? Yes. So you've been through level one internal affairs training. What do you recall about the code of the Vori V. Zakone, the thieves-in-law? They are like monks of the underworld. 
they spend more years in prison than outside it. When they are in the outside world, they live in criminal communes with a strange code of honor. They take oaths to be honest to one another, avoid conflict among themselves, and share all they have with their brother criminals. And never, ever, to offer any help to the police. So why would Morozov... Someone is hiding Babushkin's trail, or following orders to do so. But he's a wanted man. So why wasn't he sent to us immediately for intake and processing then? Since arresting Babushkin was doing him a favor. I don't follow. The thieves-in-law swear that the gulag is their home. So if we arrest one, it just sends him back into his favorite underworld. It's like handing him a one-way ticket to a mafia family reunion. What's on his record that makes him so special? His men specialize in the illegal importation of contraband cultural goods. He claims he's only providing what people want, not hurting anyone. A lot of Leningraders think he's a hero, a Robin Hood of popular music and literature. Although he takes his own cut off the top. So he's a rich man. A rich, popular man. Running a smuggling ring for banned books and music. The smuggling ring. The largest one in Leningrad. That's why it's our case in cultural affairs. So then the police should follow your orders. Or Matazov's. However, if what happened last night is any indicator, the police are taking orders from someone above us in the ministry. Who else knew that the raid was planned? Everyone at the ministry with access to cultural affairs files and level three security clearance or higher might have known. And your informant knew. Sokolov. Yes. Or rather, he knew a raid of some sort was coming, but not when or where. He's too low level for that. Back to Babushkin. How does he make his money? By giving people the little forbidden pleasures they want, with the help of his ring of associates. That's it. Exactly. What's it? We can stop him if we break the trust he has with his associates. We can let it be known that he was arrested, then spread the rumor that he's a police informer, that he named names and cooperated with our office. That's the worst thing a thief-in-law can do in terms of losing honor. That will break his network, if we can prove it. Speaking of proof, do you think they'll release Dr. Agorikin? They can hold him as long as they want to, of course, but I can't imagine what they could charge him with. Marozov's fishing in the dark. Didn't you and the doctor have a close association once? There was a time when we could have been more than friends, perhaps. Lights down. 1953. Tazia's kitchen from the earlier scene. Scattered dishes and cups, detritus left after a graduation party. Well, this is a mess I'll have to clean up. It's not important right this minute. It's still your day, still your turn to celebrate. The Ministry of Culture. That's quite an appointment for a young woman. A toast to Tazia Alation. Today, a college graduate. Tomorrow, what's your job title again? Secretary to the Assistant Deputy Undersecretary of Arts and Cultural Policy. Tomorrow, a secretary to a secretary. I'm a glorified paper pusher, really, Anton. But you'll be pushing cultural papers, not just any papers. That's what you wanted, right? It will be so much better than stamping visas. I'm proud of you. And to mark the occasion, I bought you a present. He presents her with a box, which she opens. It's the watch. It's beautiful, Anton. Thank you. She tries it on. It fits perfectly. Something practical to wear to your new office. You shouldn't have spent money on this. You're not the only one with a reason to celebrate tonight. I'm a resident, at last, <laughs> with my own apartment. That's fantastic. Living with my parents makes me feel like a child. It was kind of them to make plans tonight so you could have friends over. Well, a lot of people get married right after graduation, so I'm hoping for a single room soon. I'm on the waiting list. I understand. Living with three other medical students has been awful. You would think doctors would clean up after themselves, but it's like they expect a nurse to follow them around like they're at work. But not you. My mother raised me better than that. She'd be proud of you today if she could see you now. I wish she could. I'm sorry to have brought her up. It's all right. I, I know she would have been proud. I'm going to start cleaning up. Do you want help with the dishes? That would be nice. 
I'll put on some music. As he puts on the Shostakovich record she bought at the flea market. I'll wash. Then I'll dry. They wash and dry cups and saucers for a few moments while the Shostakovich piece plays. I'm not much for Shostakovich. Really? I've loved his music since I was little. But he's been denounced. To me, he's still a national hero. I used to have more of his records, even one that he signed, but my parents made me throw it out a few years ago. I'm sorry. You like this piece? My father took me to its premiere. It was my first professional concert. I was 12. Tell me about it. He wrote it shortly after the death of his best friend in 1944. When the death camp of Treblinka was discovered, Shostakovich turned his friend's requiem into a tribute to all the victims of the Holocaust, so no one was forgotten. I see why it means so much to you. Well, what songs would you choose to wash dishes to? Something pleasant, something that doesn't distract me from the work. We listen to music sometimes in the surgery. Did you know that? No, I didn't. I can't imagine what kinds of songs lend themselves well to cutting people open. Popular songs, mostly. Tunes you could sing along with if you wanted to. You sing while you do surgery. <laughs> of course not. But it's nice to work to a good beat when I'm stitching up afterwards. I'll keep that in mind if I ever need an operation. I'll bring a record in for the hospital staff and no band composers or experimental jazz. Not unless you want crooked stitches. <laughs> Tazia, I've been meaning to ask you... Is this about last week's debate at Komsomol? Because I won, fair and square. Not exactly. In the matter of personal relationships, friendship has its... I know, I know. Comradeship has the highest value, not friendship. We've been repeating it since Young Pioneers. It's in the pledge. I still think that friendship has... It's dangerous to put loyalty to friends above loyalty to the state. Even little children know this. I don't want to argue about how to be a good comrade right now. In the matter of personal relationships, friendship has its limits, especially between men and women. Of course, a woman should always be treated with the highest respect and admiration for her potential as a mother for future Soviet citizens. Respect and admiration are all very well, but God forbid any communist man ever has to listen to a woman in charge. As yet. We work because we must, but we're not given any jobs that matter. As yet. I have to approach the matter of personal relationships with a woman? Then here's a thought, genius. Ask one of us. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. <laughs> That's why I'm asking you. What are you asking me? I'm trying to ask you out. On a date. Oh. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not very good at it. Anton. I don't typically stay after parties to help wash with dishes. I don't usually buy presents except for family birthdays. <laughs> I don't know where you'd like to go if you did say yes. I have no idea what I'm doing. My soul is completely devoid of any romance, if I even have a soul. Anton, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to... I don't miss that you meant to. I don't apologize. It's my fault. Listen, I, I would like to get to know you better. Not just because you're beautiful and smart, because that's obvious to anyone. I know that sometimes I will lose arguments with you, just like I already do in public, like I have at Komsomol any number of times. But I don't want to stop arguing with you, so I would like to take you somewhere, sometime, if you'd like to go with me. I would like that. Thank you for asking me. You're welcome. But Anton, I'm about to start a new job. I have a hundred things to do, and I want to do so much. I don't want to make the same mistakes as my friends. What mistakes? Galina and Anatoly got married right out of secondary school. Three babies. Now they're divorced. That's awful. I didn't know that. Maya and Semyon didn't last two years out of college before he left her. Oh, I remember the Komsomol kicking Semyon out because of his infidelity. I was on the committee for that decision. It, it was a horrible business. But you and I, 
We could be different. We've known each other for years. So you know that I respect your mind. It's not only attraction. Very true. This isn't about your character. It's just, if we start down that road, I'm scared to lose you as a friend. And tonight, it's getting late. My parents will be home very soon and they'll want to sleep. Then I'll take my leave. Comrade Tazio. Comrade Anton. She kisses him quickly on the cheek, then opens the door for him. Good night. He leaves. She closes the door behind him. Then she takes the record off the record player and tries to slide it back into its sleeve, but it won't go. She slips her hand inside the sleeve and discovers the bone record. <coughs> she pulls it out, takes a good look at it, and finds the note with it. Unfolding the note, she reads, A set of eight. Decide for yourself. She puts it on the record player. She sinks into a chair and listens for a moment as the lights fade, then return to her. Office, 1956. But then I found the first phone record, just before I started working here. And that's how you first made contact with our informant. I had my suspicions about Sokolov before then, but no real way to confirm them. Shouldn't you have informed on him immediately? Perhaps. But on a practical level, I had no proof. What excuse could he have used? He sold you the record. Oh, any one of a hundred reasons. It must have been inside the record jacket before it was traded to our shop. Uh, you got it somewhere else, and now you say it was from me? So how did you get him to admit what he'd done? I didn't. Exactly. At the flea market, 1953, Moritz sets up shop. Well, if it isn't the charming misolation. Maritz, I have come to report a complaint about the quality of your merchandise. I take customer service very seriously. Please describe the nature of your complaint. The product I received from you was incomplete. There's a strict time limit on returns of purchase items. Are you referring to the Shostakovich album you bought? Because I can assure you it was sold to you un undamaged in its original State. I'm referring what? to the additional item received with purchase. Uh. In addition to the inferior quality of the recording, it simply stopped halfway through the... Three minutes. That's the hard limit. Really? Why? 78 RPM records only hold about three minutes of music aside. Why do you think popular songs are so short? Huh. I didn't know that. One of the challenges of working with lower quality recording materials, x-rays can't hold up. So people who want to hear an entire symphony can only listen to it... Three minutes at a time. But isn't three minutes better than never hearing it again? The Ministry of Culture would vastly prefer that prohibited works are never heard at all. That is the other reason I'm here. Your uncle still runs the record shop on Nevsky Prospect? The sound recorder, yes, that's his store. I have recently become junior management there. Sincere congratulations on your promotion. Sincere thanks. The extra income allows me to go to concerts occasionally. There's a jazz band playing tomorrow evening at Quadrat. Would you like to uh, accompany me there? I, I have plans with my parents tomorrow night, but thank you for asking. Let me know if your plans change. Uh, we were speaking of my uncle. <clears throat> the Committee on Arts has authorized a sweep of recording shops in the Telstra... Tel Sen... Old... Let me try this again. Uh, the Committee on Arts has authorized a sweep of recording shops in the... I have to look it up. I'm sorry. Centralny. Thank you. Okay. The Committee on Arts has authorized a sweep of recording shops in the Central New ah. District within the next two weeks. I see. All sites will be visited and searched for illegal literature and recordings in order to eliminate undesirable Western influences and preserve the morality of Soviet youth. Of course. Consequences for the manufacture and sale of contraband may include up to five years of imprisonment and exile to the Gulag. I trust you are aware of this. I am. I also trust that junior management will ensure that your shop carries only official recordings. No recording machinery, no 
phone records and your satellite office as well. I can assure you any such sweep of our premises will find nothing of the kind in, in either location. The planned raid begins tomorrow. It is quite possible I'll close the office here early today then. Shall I leave you to your work? Until we meet again. And Tazja. Yes? I greatly appreciate your making me aware of the situation at hand. If not the concert tomorrow night, another time perhaps? For dinner? Another time, perhaps. Thank you for your kind invitation. She returns to her office, 1956. So I warned Sokolov about the dangers of trading banned merchandise and made them immediate to him personally. I still couldn't prove his involvement, but I could win his trust. Was your informant Sokolov a thief-in-law? No, but he knew some of them. One in particular. Our man Babushkin. Precisely. He told me once that Babushkin had dated his mother. So I thought if I could get to know Sokolov better, I could learn more about the network he was involved in than about the man who was running it. But it would do me no good to report, well, a small fish in the big criminal pond of Leningrad. Precisely the kind of independent decision-making our comrade Morozov does not approve of. Morozov cannot play chess. He plays checkers. He only sees the move right in front of him. Which right now is Dr. Igorigan. What does he have to do with any of this? As little as possible, I hope. In the interrogation room, Anton has been waiting alone. Moritzov enters. How long will you detain me? My patients need attending to. I'm scheduled in surgery this afternoon. That surgery will need to be postponed, perhaps indefinitely. What am I still being held for? I told you, <clears throat> you are considered an accessory to a crime, obstruction of justice. You might as well arrest a pothole or a lamppost. That man could have tripped over his own feet. Our men say otherwise, that you knocked one down and tripped the other to slow their pursuit. This is ridiculous. You're keeping me from the hospital. If you want to return to work so urgently, tell me, doctor, why are you protecting Moritz Sokolov? What are you talking about? I think you know. You know about his criminal activities. You know why he is an undesirable. And you'll be held here until you tell us why, or you'll risk the same consequences. Morisov enters, uh, exits. Summer, 1956. Moritz is at the flea market, setting up the booth. Good afternoon, Anton. What brings you to my office today? I have a problem I'm thinking through. Long walks help me think. See, I've just finished my residency. Congratulations. Now that I'm a doctor, officially on staff, I have to go to administrative meetings. That sounds boring. Usually it is. But the hospital just received notice that we must expunge our patient records. All old test results and all files of former patients who have been deemed undesirable. That's a lot. The Marinsky Hospital has been open for 150 years. How could you possibly know if any given record belonged to someone who has since... That is the problem. If you're the most junior doctor on staff, they must have made it your problem. That's why I'm out walking on my day off. Well, you can keep all the infant records, but wait a minute. Old test results? X-rays, perhaps? They're exactly the problem. Old x-rays can catch fire like you wouldn't believe once they get hot enough. Water can't even put it out. Really? In Petrograd Hospital, a records room caught fire just last month. So now we've got to clean ours out. I can't help you with your record sorting problem, I'm afraid, but I can take the x-rays off your hands if you'd like to make a trade. Why would you do that? I have friends who could put them to use. Your friends are bootleggers? They use the x-rays to make bone records? Can you support that accusation? I, I wasn't trying to accuse. Look, I think we both have something the other person wants. You have something you need to dispose of that I know how to put to good use. What do you want in return? I want a good idea for where to take Tazia on a date. So, your graduation gift was well received. Uh, she put it on. I think she liked it. That sounds like an excellent beginning. 
She kissed me goodnight on the cheek. Better yet. And then I asked her out. And she sort of said yes sometime, but she was busy. And I brought it up again last week and she said yes. But I haven't told her where, when, where we're going or, or when. No wonder you need advice. Remind me, what's she doing for work, do you think? She's just been promoted to the position of Assistant Undersecretary of Cultural Policy. Let me, let me think on it. When do you work on the hospital next? I have the night shift tomorrow evening. Why don't you take out the trash from the records room right around 11? I could do that. Then take a smoke break on the west side. I'll meet you, give you a few ideas that she might like, and then I'll play garbage man. In the meantime, try not to look so devious. Enjoy your walk, it's a beautiful day, and best of luck in solving your problem. See you tomorrow. Anton returns to the interrogation room, 1956. I am here to complete your intake forms, Dr. Rigorikin. Have you been given water at a meal? I have. Do you need to be escorted to the toilet? I can request a guard. Not right now. Have you answered the interrogator's questions accurately and to the best of your ability? I have. Then you have nothing to fear while you are in our custody. I'm not so sure about that. Look, can you tell me when? I need to get word to my supervisor at the hospital. They'll be wondering where I am and this. I, I cannot help you with that, Dr. Rigorigan. I am here as part of your intake procedure. What does that mean? that you are officially in the custody of the Ministry of Cultural Affairs in relation to an internal affairs investigation. As such, our Deputy Undersecretary has been notified. Deputy Undersecretary Elation? Yes. As the investigation proceeds, you may be called back to interrogation at any time. A holding cell is in preparation. You will soon be released to that section of the facility. I understand. During your time in confinement, you should review any recent actions which might have led to your arrest. The only good story is a true story, Doctor. Be sure you have paid attention to detail. Tasia enters to join Anton on a date in a social club, where a not particularly great band is just finishing a set. What do you think of the band? Do you like the music? I'm surprised they have a bassoon player. He's playing the saxophone part. I know. It's awful. I mean, he's probably as talented as anyone. But I don't see how banning saxophones has improved Soviet music. The composers didn't write originally for bassoons. I thought we weren't going to talk about work tonight. Maybe that's why we're so quiet. Well, I'll tell you something about my work day then. Good news. I found a solution to my records problem today. We can simply rethink our filing system for the older records. How would that work? If a patient has been to our hospital since 1955, then we know they weren't arrested or killed or made undesirable in the last purge. So step one, we keep the full patient file for anyone who has come in since then. And step two? Pull and dispose of all the records of dead patients. The Marinsky's got 150 years of patient history. That's a lot of physical evidence that we are carefully following orders. You've got a step three in mind. For any patient still alive, we'll remove the old x-rays from their files. For fire code compliance, of course. Then keep their records in some other order. Birth dates, alphabetical by first name, whatever you like. Still searchable, but only to a select few. We'd be in compliance with the state directive. But you could preserve the patient history, as long as someone's on staff who knows how to run the alternate filing system. Very clever, Anton. You know, I've been considering a second job. Why? I want to help my father. More than I have, at least. He needs your help? He hasn't showed up at work a few times. He was written up for tardiness twice this month. Since my mother died, he really hasn't been the same. He, he doesn't look out for his own health. He drinks too much. It's a shame, really. What will you do? I ran into Moritz at Goom Market a few weeks ago. He mentioned a local opportunity for a very part-time assistant, flexible hours. I'm not sure I like the sound of that. All I do is help him transport some trash occasionally and create some art projects. 
art projects? It's a little hard to explain, but I took him up on it. So you've already taken the second job. I can quit at any time. It's on a mutual trial basis. What kind of art are you making? The kind that involves something I'm good at. Would you like to see where we work? Suddenly, Tazia's phone rings in Tazia's office. Internal Affairs, Cultural Policy Division, Comrade Olation speaking. No, this is not Comrade Marzov's line. Let me transfer you. She pushes a combination of buttons, then hangs up. The phone rings again. Internal Affairs, Cultural Policy Division, Comrade Olation speaking. No, this is not Comrade Morozov's line. The transfer must not have gone through. My apologies. Our phone system is not functioning today. May I take a message and pass it to him personally? She takes notes. I'll be sure he gets the message right away, Officer Petrov. Thank you for your call. She hangs up. The kitchen has been cleaned. The bread is in the oven. What nonsense unless it's in some kind of code. Stetla re-enters. For relation, I have a copy of- Deputy Kabakova, I need to make a quick trip across town to conduct some field work. It may help us find our missing operative. But the interrogation report just came in from- Cover for me, uh, cover for me while I'm gone. Tell people I will be back in the office shortly. Use my desk, keep processing paperwork, and take messages if you receive any more phone calls on my line. Yes, Comrade Alation. Late summer, 1956. A bachelor pad of sorts. A couch and a few chairs around a coffee table. A light box plugged into the back wall. The kind doctors use in examining rooms to look at x-rays. And lots of x-rays hanging by clothespins from yards strung around the room like a spider web. A Telefunken record lathe machine in the room. It looks a lot like a record player. Moritz pulls a disc off the machine and slides it into a record sleeve. He lights up a smoke. Anton takes the first x-ray off the light. Vladimir Mariatrovsky, broken leg. He hands the x-ray to Tazia, who starts cutting a round disc from it. Poor bastard. He was lucky. It set really well. Healed quick enough. Still, not easy to drive one, one around for six weeks in a cast. Broken arms are better. I've got one of those around here somewhere. Uh, Nadia Lermentov, right humorous. It's not funny. I know it's not, but... I think it's pretty humorous. What are we copying tonight? Elvis Presley. I'll find you a pelvis then. Which song? Don't be cruel. Here, Tazia, hand me that. See, my uncle taught me this. If you touch it, just till it smolders, it won't spark. And it's easier than trying to cut a perfect hole in the middle. He quickly burns a cigarette hole through the center, then puts it on the disc cutter and turns it on. Here, Tazia. He hands her another x-ray. She looks at it before starting to cut. Who was this one? The label's gone. So much for the record. These were all meant to be destroyed. Now they're trash, on their way to mass graves. The people? Or the x-rays? Both. The people first, then. You know, the KGB still bring prisoners to us for stitching up before take them to taking them to jail. All right, enough. You're right. No politics. We're working. Cut faster. You can only sell so many copies a day. What's the rush? The faster we cut, we etch them, I sell them. The better. You prefer low inventory. I prefer low risk. Are you expecting to be raided? Who knows? My boss wants a hundred of these by tomorrow. Tazia drinks. She cuts. Maureen's drinks. He smokes. Anton drinks. He grabs a stack of x-rays and reviews them in the light, dropping them to the floor when he's done with each. Diana Lazareva. Irana Lyotov. Ruslan Akulich. No name. No name. Might as well have never had a name. The broken bones, the, the chest pain, the lung cancer never happened. That's what a purge is, right? Cleansing, a clean slate. But the state hospital is not any cleaner now than six years ago. This little boy never had his skull cracked open by a drunken father. He was my patient, Koya Zvakin. 
Without his record, no one will know his history or what a rat bastard his father was. Anton, it doesn't do any good to- Without records, we can't help our patients, run experimental trials, do our jobs. By destroying these archives, the authorities want the doctors to erase ourselves. You need a break. Let me get you a glass of water or- I'm fine. I should be fine. What about a distraction? Listen to this. He, smells, he pulls out a small black and white volume from the stacks on the coffee table. An American poet. You should get to know his work, Tasia. Allen Ginsberg. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn looking for an angry fix. Angle-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo and the machinery of night. The poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high set up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats floating across the tops of cities contemplating jazz. Is that what their best minds do? We're smoking. They can smoke too. We pass through universities with radiant cool eyes hallucinating Arkansas and blake light tragedy among the scholars of war who broke down crying in, in white gymnasiums, naked and trembling before the machinery of other skeletons. Please, stop. That part reminded me of you tonight, standing there surrounded by bones and death. Look, we're three tiny cogs in the Soviet machine. Don't we know it? But our little rebellion, here in this abandoned room, it's our way of standing up to the machinery of other skeletons. You know? State policy would destroy these records, deny the purges, erase the past. So tonight we turn hospital waste into beautiful music. You know, this is how we say no. No, there was a past. People lived, people loved, people died. By the thousands and tens of thousands, you can jail and butcher the undesirables. You can melt their records. You can silence their keepers. But you cannot destroy that truth. It will rise from their blood and bones and ashes. It will be heard again. So what really matters to you, Anton? You still have a chance to heal people. And I turn one kind of record into another. I want to read the rest of the poem. Take it. But you should know it's been seized for obscenity. It's American. I can't believe it ever got into Russia in the first place. No, in America. The San Francisco bookstore owner who published it has been arrested. In the world capital for free speech? Where you can say anything? I don't think you can say anything there. Or anywhere else. I need a break. I'm going outside for a minute. Get some fresh air. This work isn't good for him. Why not? He still wants the ministry to be right. About music and culture and all of it. But I think there's a whole world out there. I've never been outside the Soviet Union. Have you? Do you remember during the war when we were told that Americans were our brothers in victory? American music, clothes, literature, movies, everywhere. I remember. I fell in love then, Tasia. I fell in love with American jazz. You know, I wanted to be a musician, wandering the world, just me and my horn, you know, making my way. All the movies I saw about New York City. Manhattan, Harlem, so many clubs, so many people, so much music to make. And you had to be good to make them dance. I wanted to be that good. So I practiced and listened and copied and improvised. And then... Zedanov. And then according to our great comrade Zedanov, everything Western was all the darkest evil. American movies, banned. American jazz, poisoned. Even the saxophones. Stalin melted down the only instruments that mattered. So now when I listen to Russian jazz, all I can hear is what's missing. So that's why you sell bone records. I'm not an enemy of this state. Mother Russia is way too big for me to take her own. I just want to, to be able to hear the music that I love. Well, that's a simple thing. I believe it's a good thing. There's nothing simple about it. <laughs> Anton should never have brought you here. Or know what he was thinking. I can't unknow what I know now. It's my job to report you. 
but you're not going to. The ministry where I work believes people like you are creating a deviant culture that undermines communist ideals. The office where you work assumes I eat human souls for breakfast every day because I love saxophones. What, what time is it? You're wearing a watch. That's right, I am. Do you like it? The watch? It was a present from Anton. Yes. I do like it. You're welcome. What? Never mind. Why are you here? This is my apartment. No. Why did you come back to Leningrad? Um, op opportunity. You know, to work with my uncle because Viborg had nothing for me to do except listen to the radio and fix other people's radios. So you do all this to get a few records into the hands of a few people. A great danger to yourself and to people who associate with you. Like Anton. Like me. Why are you doing this? Because I care about beautiful things. I don't know what you mean. L Leningrad has universities, right? Yes. Lots of young people, all hungry for what's real. Uh, blues, uh, jazz, rock and roll. People our age don't want socialist realism. They want to hear songs about being young and being in love. You know? Love me tender. I want you to be my girl. Tonight you belong to me. Why do fools fall in love? Are you asking me? He kisses her. Anton re-enters quietly. He watches the two of them for a moment, but they don't take notice of him until he leaves, slamming the door. Tasia and Moritz jump apart. I should go after him. You shouldn't go alone. Not in this neighborhood. I'll come with you. They grab coats and exit as Anton reappears in the interrogation room. I have a copy of your statements from our earlier conversations today for your review. These are not the questions you asked me, and these are not my answers. But they are now part of the official record. Perhaps you begin to understand. This document is complete fiction. If you are so, so sure what the truth is, Dr. Igorikin, now is a fine time to start telling it to me. I have told you the truth several times. I was out for a walk. I was knocked over by a policeman who you say was in pursuit of a criminal. On the contrary. You were serving as a lookout for a dangerous transaction related to criminal activity in a neighborhood in which you had no legitimate business. When the police were in pursuit of a fleeting, fleeing criminal, one Moritz Sokolov, you accosted them, tackling one and tripping the other. These policemen have testified to this truth. They're two signed witnesses against your single testimony, which as a result, I did not recall. I instead wrote down your admission of guilt as an accomplice to a crime. I have admitted nothing. On the contrary, doctor, you have admitted to, admitted to involvement with the Vori Visacone. You have accepted bribes and traded in contraband goods. You have corrupted the morality of Leningrad's youth with the illegal importation of Western music, and you have named several associates by name, including Moritz Sokolov. We have not found him yet, doctor, but we will. Surely you can't simply make up whatever you hoped I would say and write it down under my name. I have rights. I will receive a trial. Your deception will be exposed. A copy of these statements is now sitting on Undersecretary Oleshin's desk since it is her duty to review every arrest related to matters of cultural affairs. So, she will soon know of your betrayal, but there is no longer anything she can do to assist you. I will shortly arrest her as well for developing an underground network of informants without proper documentation. You see, Internal affairs, politics are rarely subject to oversight and they are never forgiven. Unless there is something you wish to tell me, Dr. Rigorikin, something in the record you wish to correct, 
about one or more of your associates? Suit yourself. Moritzov leaves. Anton sits alone. End Act One. Act Two. Lights come up on Moritz's basement apartment. It has been almost demolished, raided, searched carelessly. The door has been knocked off its hinges. The light box on the back wall is cracked. Other evidence of a struggle. There is a smear of blood on the coffee table. There is police tape across garbage bags of x-rays. Tazia enters, alone. She is wearing a coat and gloves. The apartment is now a KGB crime scene. And Tazia is here as the ranking investigation authority into a raid. She walks around the space slowly, looking at things, picking them up, putting them down. She clears off one of the chairs, the one where she sat in the last apartment scene, and sits in it. Help me find you. Lights on the seating area shift. Moritz enters and takes his seat across from her. We only have half an hour. I'll be back in my own room by curfew. Are you telling me? Or promising yourself? Both. I need to be home tonight. The girls are getting together, and I'll be missed if I'm not there. All right. Anton has asked me not to report you to the authorities. That's surprising. It shouldn't be. He's a good person. I don't want him caught up in this. He's a grown man, Tasha. He's going to make his own choices. I am asking you to stop working with him. Don't let him get any deeper into this, this unofficial business of yours. I'm not going to ask him to do anything he doesn't want to. No pressure. Do you know why he needs the money? No, do you? He told me once he was taking a second job because he wanted to help his father, but I don't really know why. Except that money always helps, I suppose. That's a concern. Would he unform of both, on both of us? Never. Then nothing has changed, has it? He's not doing anything more dangerous than before. He's not going to come, even going to come here. I won't get him more deeply involved in my end of the business. We spoke about it this morning. Everything has changed since yesterday. Last night, I left my apartment on my first serious date in years with a man I genuinely like and respect and admire. At the end of the night, you walked home long after curfew with another man. You aren't just any other man. Well, I do have some distinguishing features. You did more than walk me home. I'd do it again and more if you wanted, but only if... I know that's not why you're here. Do you? Because I don't know that. Tasia. I should have stayed longer last night. I think you I could have stayed until the morning. You would have regretted that. People talk. I've spent my life afraid of people's talk, second-guessing myself, worrying about what I ought to be doing. You don't know the first thing about me and what my life is like. You know, if you knew... Tell me the first thing, then. And the second. A kiss. Then he takes her by the shoulders and puts her at arm's length. Do not kid yourself for one moment that I'm going to be good for you. I'm not kidding myself. I mean it, Tajia. There's no way we've got a future together. Why not? Really? I'm extremely unlikely to die of old age. It comes with the job. So get a different job. It's too late for that. No, it's not. The people I work with, they don't let you just walk away. I know that, but your market is changing, haven't you heard? Just last week, Khrushchev told the ministry he wants a new thaw in cultural relations. We've been asked to consider allowing the importation of music from the West. That's just talk, Tajia. It happened before, remember? And then bam! Deportation, imprisonment, exile, the gulag, just like before for musicians, but only worse. But what if it's not? Maybe someday, sooner than you think, you could run a record store that sells any music you want, right here in Leningrad. I'll believe it when I see it. I believe it now. Or at least, I believe it's possible. So you're going to have to work a lot harder than that to convince me I shouldn't be here with you. You have 23 minutes. What if I told you I already, ha I already have a girlfriend? I'm smarter than she is, whoever she is. I'll be more useful to you. What if I told you I have three or four girlfriends? Hmm, I'd like to meet them all, get to know your taste. 
What if I told you I'm not in love with you? You never said you were in love with me, so at least you haven't lied. What if I told you everything about the way my life is, Mike? You know, not just the first thing or the second, but all of it. My father was killed in the war, at the front. My little sister died in the siege. My mom stayed single after that, though she'd had her fair share of companions through the years. We moved in with my Uncle Nicky when I was just a little kid, and he used to be, well, wrapped up in all kinds of monkey business. A few years ago, my uncle wanted to go straight. He was getting too old, he said, but he couldn't just leave the thieves' community. And he stepped in after my father died, so I owed him. So when I came back to Leningrad, I took his place in the Kodla, the local smuggling ring. Now I live in a place that's been condemned because it's all I can afford. When I'm not at the store behind the counter or at the flea market behind the tables, I'm skulking around the harbors and hotels, picking out tourists who might have something they'd be willing to sell. Then I approach them, trying not to scare the hell out of them, knowing I risk arrest every single time if I guess wrong, and asking them for their cast-offs. The tourists, it's like begging. The sailors are worse. They want 10 times what an album is worth. Half the time, they don't even give me what they say they've got. Or how about the glamour of going through hospital trash? I have to clean the medical waste off the x-rays, risking infection or worse for the few rubles a bone record in that's Then there are the days when I have to pay the thieves in law so they don't torch the store or my apartment or my mother or my uncle. So I pay for protection so I can keep making people happy with the music they love and miss and wish for music from their childhood, you know, know from their favorite albums, their first dates, their wedding songs, music that's been banned. The people you work with, Tazi, they think that if they just catch and punish enough hungry people, they'll wipe out hunger. But they won't. That's not how hunger works. Or maybe I'm wrong. But I'm just a bad person, you know. I already know I'm not the man you deserve, and there's no way for me to get from there to here. This isn't your world, Tazi. Stay out of it. 19 minutes. Not leaving. What could I say to convince you to go? Tell me you don't want me here. Tell me last night didn't matter to you at all. You're not very convincing. You left my room last night in search of another man. I should have stayed with the one right in front of me. But you did. But I'm here now. Maybe you shouldn't be. I can decide for myself what I should and shouldn't do. You can, and you will. If you want me to lie for you, fine. I don't want you here. Last night you didn't matter to me at all. You know, I've never loved you since the first time we met, you know, and I'm not in love with you now, and I will, I will never always love you. You're a good liar. You believe me? I believe you're lying. Moritz kisses her again, then he leaves. Lights return us to the damaged, raided reality of Moritz's present-day apartment. Leave me a clue. Trust me, though I don't know why you would. She rises, again walking through the apartment, searching for any trace he might have left behind. She opens the oven. There's a stack of rubles in it. She counts them and puts them in her purse. She comes to the broken light box and runs a glove along it. There is a piece of x-ray film wedged, wedged into or behind it, sticking out slightly. Tazia pulls it out. It is a bone record. She slips it inside her coat and returns to her office. Tazia plays the bone record from Moritz's apartment. Duke Ellington's Take the A Train plays. Svetla knocks, then enters carrying paperwork. Comrade Alation. Yes? I received a phone message. Yes, what was it? Very odd. I don't think it was for me. I don't even think it was meant for internal affairs. Perhaps the problem is bigger than our office. It could be. What was the message? Natasia, the bird's wing is mended. You didn't recognize the voice then? No. Did a man or woman leave the message? It was a man's voice. Thank you for notifying me. Natasia, the bird's wing is mended. I will add it to the incident documentation. Has any paperwork for Babushkin's arrest come through yet? I've seen nothing, although I expect we'll be asked to handle the intake interview when he arrives at the ministry. It is scheduled for this afternoon. And Comrade Morozov? I thought you would want to be the first to see his interrogation report regarding Dr. Igorigan. Svetla hands the report to Tazia, who reads it silently for a few moments. This is quite a confession. I didn't read it, well, not thoroughly, but it's not good, is it? 
Listening to music at work now, are you? Evidence from the Babushkin investigation. I don't recognize the tune. Neither do I, but I'm sure someone in the ministry will. I see you've been given my interrogation notes to type up for the ministry files. I'm not your typist. It's too bad about your boyfriend. He seemed like such a catch. He's not my boyfriend. The gulags need more doctors to treat the sick in the midst of all that filth and disease. No matter what he's admitted to doing, there will be a trial first. Trials are for those who plead guilty are very short indeed. It was working directly with your informant. Or were you not close enough associates to be aware of that? We haven't found Sokolov yet, but we will. I agree. And I'll send them both to the gulag. You might wish to make typing up those notes your first priority. I expect your associations with both men to result in an internal investigation. I'd hate for you to have unfinished paperwork when you are removed from your position. Charming. He's right. They'll put me on leave at the very at the very least for associating with a petty criminal, unless I can find a way to prove this confession was forged. How would you do that? I need time to think. Let me type up the notes. I can take that off your hands at least. Thank you. And comrade? Yes? The song is by an American, Duke Ellington, in case it's useful. We work together to rise together. Svetlo leaves. Tazia meets Moritz at the flea market. One of my favorite shoppers. Today, I am here on business, Moritz. Are we being wiretapped? Not here. I'm sure of that. That's why I'm here. You're telling me something you shouldn't. You told me about your situation the other night, and I have an idea. You sound serious. I've been thinking, what if you could go straight? What? There's going to be a change soon in cultural policy, I told you. Free music importation across the borders. The draft policy went through second round discussion and approval in the Ministry Central Committee this morning. I don't doubt your word, but I'll believe it when it happens. If you knew it was only a few months, maybe less, would you give up the unofficial side of your business if you could? You, you know, I, I believe in what I'm doing. But you don't enjoy the risk. I wouldn't associate with criminals if I didn't have to. But I don't think what we're doing is wrong. You know, music belongs to the people. I help put it in their hands. I thought Vore were allowed to go straight, to leave the underworld and lead honest lives if they chose. Or is that just a myth? I've never been a Vore. I'm what they call a domashniki. A homeworker. Family ties keep me in place. I'm my mother's only son, so I'm too easy to find, too easy to put pressure on. It makes me a bad master criminal and an excellent, controllable middleman. What if you could protect your family for good without paying off the war? In what world could that happen? Hear me out. What if a raid brought down Babushkin? You're going to arrest a war? That's like sending a rabbit back to his warren, and I'd still have to pay off through his network. No, we're going to arrest you during a raid on his entire smuggling network. Then I can make it look like you've cooperated with us so that they kick you out of the ring. You know what the Vor think of having contract, contacts with law enforcement. You're talking with me right now, and you could be informing on someone. You're not in uniform. And strictly speaking, you're not a policewoman. I could be seducing you purpose, just using you to get the information I need to avoid the truth. Sweet talker. And you could be cooperating with me right now, even as you deny it. I know you're trying to help Tajia, but there's no way out. If only I could find a way out of the country completely. What would you do then? Find work as a radio repairman or a broadcast announcer if I could get it. Find a way to get money back to my m mother so I know she'd be all right. I'm trying to tell you something. I'll listen more closely then. I have been charged to plan a raid on Babushkin's ring next week by my superiors at the ministry. I do not know the motivation, but I am informed of some of the details. 
So your visit is a warning. Avoid the raid. The plan is simple. Destroy his ring, then announce the new cultural policy so they destroy his market. No one needs to buy banned music if music is no longer banned. Precisely. I have not yet informed on your specific location, but with your permission, I am going to. And you want to arrest me there? If you're, uh, if you're in a ministry jail during and right after the raid, you'll be tried at the same time as everyone else. If the whole ring is captured at the same time, it will be impossible to work out who informed who. Within a few months, it won't matter anyway, because there's a flaw they haven't seen in their own plan yet. What's that? Once the cultural policy is announced, they can hardly try the middlemen for a crime that isn't a crime anymore. Do you have a better plan? If I did, I wouldn't tell you, would I? That would make me an informant. This changes everything between us, doesn't it? Nothing has changed. No, I told you already, it doesn't matter how I feel about you. You've always been ambitious. You've always been political. You've always wanted to change the world. You were always going to rise within the system. I've known that since we were kids. So go ahead, arrest me, make your plans. I am asking for your help to keep you as safe as I can. I may be safest if I disappear. Your choice. Don't tell me, but I will ask you for one thing. What's that? If you, if you are not arrested, will you find a way to send me word? I have known so many people who just disappear. I, I can't promise anything, but I'll, I'll do my best. Hey, tell you what, I'll call your office. Bites down, then up on interrogation room. A man we have not seen before sits alone. This is Babushkin, the Vor boss himself. Tazia enters. I am here to collect your initial statement about the events of the night of September 24th. I see the Ministry of Culture has begun allowing the advancement of women in its ranks. You weren't here on my last tour of duty, I'd remember. Your full name, please. And so polite. Of course, young lady. Vladimir Petrovich Babushkin. Shall I spell it? Those are common names. I go by Vasya Brilliant. And that is common knowledge. Here's the top search result. You are here to play good cop to someone else's bad cop. But there are no good cops. I'm not a cop, good or bad. I'm a secretary, here to record your intake report. You'll write down what you want, like they all do. On the night of September 24th, at what time and where were you apprehended? Why are you asking me questions you already know the answers to? I do not know the answers, but I very much wish to. Hmm. I was apprehended at the Metropole Restaurant on Sadovaya Street at approximately 9.27 p.m. Approximately. My watch runs a few minutes slow sometimes, other times not. And you were alone at the time? My two associates and I were being entertained by some business partners when we were detained by the KGB. Was the arrest peaceful? What do you think? I ask in order to deter rumors that the KGB handles criminals with unnecessary roughness. And what do you observe? Mm, you have fresh stitches below your left eye. The doctor who gave them to you is now in our custody. His superior confirmed that last night you passed through the emergency medicine surgery at the Marinsky Hospital, but perhaps roughness was necessary. So I invite your response to my initial question. Was the arrest peaceful? My men gave as good as we got, but we were taken in the end, vastly outnumbered. Have you been told what you are being charged with? Whatever the ministry wants to charge me with, I imagine. Smuggling contraband goods across national borders, bootlegging foreign recordings, 
production and manufacture of recordings of Russian emigre music and songs of the criminal genres from the West. It's as though you've been here before. I doubt your questions will surprise me. How many years have you been in love with Natasia Sokolov? That question is not on your intake form. May I know the name of my interrogator? Tadia Oleshin. Ah, Miss Oleshin, now I'm glad I asked. Moritz Sokolov's woman on the inside. Do not belong to him. Nor he to you. Very true. I repeat, how long have you been in love with Natasia Sokolov? What difference does that make to your report? I have a message for her from her missing son. Did information from Moritz contribute to the success of your raid on my ring? He flatly refused to every state at every stage to collaborate with the authorities, including myself. Information in this matter has flowed in one direction from me to him for him to use as he thought best to decide for himself. Then you are a fool. But I'm not a liar. Who knew where to find me last night then? The tabloid reporters who follow organized criminals everywhere and the maitre d' at the Metropole who confirmed your reservation. Who knew where to find my suppliers? The garbage men who work with Leningrad hospital routes. When hospital trash started disappearing, the bags soon reappeared in nearby neighborhoods. I spoke with them about their routes. They knew where to find the hospital leftovers. That narrowed it down to the cross streets nearest your suppliers. You're very thorough. Not thorough enough to have arrested everyone in your ring. There's one man missing. Maurice. I will not ask you if you know where he is, because I know you would not tell me if you did. Don't ask questions you already know the answers to. Very wise. I will finish your intake form in just a moment. But first, I need two things from you. I give nothing to the police. First, I ask you only to confirm what you have already indicated. Is it true that you received the stitches under your left eye last night after your arrest at the Marinsky Hospital? It is. Would you recognize the doctor if I showed you a picture of him? I would. That's him. Thank you. Your words will save an honest man from a life in prison. Too bad the gulag could use more good doctors. <laughs> so I've heard. I promise you nothing, but what is your second request? Tell Natasia. The bird's wing has mended. I promised him he'd never have to worry about her, that I'll take care of her. I'll take care of the money. I have no way to tell him anything anymore, but please tell her. When I have the chance, if I ever have the chance. Lights down and up on Tazia's office a few hours later. Moritzov enters without knocking. Have you finished your typing? Are all your reports in order? Yes, and it's been an immensely productive day. Most interesting. I have notified our superiors of Dr. Igorikin's report and its contents. Our superiors, plural? Comrade Secretary Zolotov shows you no end of favoritism. So I went beyond our immediate superior in internal affairs and sent copies of the report both to the executive committees of our local Soviets and to our superior offices in the KGB hierarchy. Very thorough, Comrade Morozov. You seem undisturbed, Comrade Oleshin. Your report was forged. I can prove it. The key witness is already in our custody, and getting him to testify on this matter will destroy the criminal ring I was tasked to bring down. I don't follow. According to your report, 
Dr. Igorkin was arrested at 8.23 p.m. yesterday evening for interfering with a police investigation and accosting an officer in pursuit. Yes. But over an hour later, he was still at the Marinsky Hospital, stitching up patients, including one Vladimir Babushkin. You may have heard of him. Babushkin identified Anton Igorkin as the doctor in the surgery who gave him stitches yesterday evening at approximately 9.47 p.m. when he was not yet in your custody. That identification has been corroborated by Dr. Igorkin's superior on duty yesterday evening, Chief Surgeon Voronin, who was at work in the surgery when the KGB brought Babushkin in. I have filed Babushkin's intake report and Voronin's corroborating statement with our immediate superior, Secretary Zolotov, and to the executive committees of our local Soviets and to our superior offices in the KGB hierarchy, attached, of course, to copies of your clearly forged report. Because Babushkin participated in the identification and contributed to an active investigation, he has now collaborated with the police. After 34 years as a Vor, sworn never to do so. And yes, I finished my typing for today. Now get out of my office. Lights down. The flea, outside Moritz's closed stall, a few weeks later. Thank you for taking my call and for agreeing to meet with me. Thank you for meeting me here. Of course. <clears throat> but now that we're here together, I don't really know where to begin. It's been weeks. I've been busy. I've been worried. I've mostly been at the hospital. We've been short staffed. You no, know Moritz is gone. I thought you might know where he was going. How would I know? Was he detained? Was with Babushkin or later? How would I know? If you don't? You told me once that the police take their prisoners to your hospital for stitching up before they... I thought you might have seen him if he was hurt. There was blood on his table. No. I haven't seen him that night or since. And my colleagues... I'd ask, but we do not keep records on patients who are escorted by the KGB. Hospital policy. Of course. I understand. What are you going to do? I've been relieved of, res of responsibilities while Internal Affairs conducts its investigation. But I know you have a plan. So what's your angle in the meantime? I'm on leave, except I haven't left and I can't go anywhere. So right now, all I can do is wait for Maritz to make contact. But you know as well as I do. Any effort to make contact on my part, anything at all, could make it worse for him. I know. What if they think you're an informant because of your arrest the night of the raid? You should take time off from the hospital, can you? Just long enough to see you, like I am today. Then I'm going back to work. And then work is going to take me somewhere I won't have to worry anymore. I don't understand. That's why I called and asked to see you, Tazia. Look. I was offered a very unusual chance a few months ago to do some research, international research. I wasn't sure at first I even wanted the opportunity. And then with everything that happened with you, I wanted to go. I had to pay some pretty large bribes, but I found out just last week I made the team. You're leaving the country? I can bring my father with me to Canada. He can get a good job there and the change of scenery it will help him, I hope. When do you leave? Four days. Do you already have the visas? I don't know. Maybe I don't have them all yet. That's why I'm here. I don't follow. You won't always be this lucky. Sooner or later, you'll cross the wrong person and be sentenced to the gulag or worse. You said so yourself. I know that. But why don't you come with me instead? And pretend to be a family member? As my wife. I'm not asking you to love me, Tazia. Just let me keep you safe. <laughs> you don't even know if he's alive. I don't. You could be waiting for a dead man. I could be. They'll come for you next. And God only knows what will happen then. I don't want to lose you, Tazia. Come with me, please. I can't. Don't 
I deserve your trust? You won't even think of it? No, oh, Anton, it's not about trust. They'll never grant me a visa while the internal affairs investigation is in progress. They won't let you go either if you marry me. But I'm so glad you've already found a way out for you and your father. Well done. Does, yeah. Listen to me. You deserve a wife who loves you. Maybe more than anyone I've ever met. I am so grateful for everything you have ever done for me. Please believe that. But now you need to go as far away as you can and as fast as you can. Keep your father safe. Find happiness for yourself. I don't know what happiness looks like, Tazia. Then if there's one good true thing to be found in Canada or wherever you're going, I hope you find it and write me and tell me about it. Before I leave then, Tazia. Yes. I want to kiss you goodbye. Tazia puts her arms around him, looks up at him, waiting. He kisses her on the forehead, holds her for a moment, then leaves without a word. Lights down. Tazia's office, several months later. Tazia enters, carrying a pile of mail and a small brown paper package. She opens the package. It's a tape recorder with a cartridge inside. She presses play. The recording begins with radio static, then Duke Ellington's Take the A Train. Greetings from Sweden, land of the free. Tazia stops the tape. She rewinds it, starts it again in shock. Greetings from Sweden, land of the free. Although unfortunately I'm only free to move in one direction, away from the woman I love. Isn't that the story of the blues? You're listening to a special edition of the Voice of America Jazz Hour, courtesy of Voice of America. I'm Maurice Sokolov, in for Willis Conover this week while he's on the road. And in honor of Valentine's Day, tonight's show is all about love story. Love lost, love found, young love, old love, love with the girl next door, and love with the woman who's thousands of miles away. Love so good you want to remember it forever, and love that hurts so bad you can never forget. Don't touch that dial for the next hour as we bring you the greatest jazz, the baddest blues, and the biggest hits. In our second half, Willis interviews Dave Brubeck during his recent tour to Poland. But first, one of the saddest stories ever told. In 1955, legendary sax player Charlie Parker left this earth for the great beyond. After his two-year-old daughter Pre died, Bird was inconsolable. He was an alcoholic and a heroin user and he had tried to drown his grief in a bottle, and it didn't work. Some birds are just not meant to be caged, but he knew more about how to lose a girl than most of us ever want to learn. Let's start this hour with the trail off of his album, Charlie Parker played Fort Lord. This is easy to love. Tazia sits and listens as the music takes over. End of play. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the Ghost Light series. I want to thank the wonderful actors who donated their time to this effort. We're so proud of their work and we couldn't do it without them. I want to thank Heather Beasley for her wonderful play. If you're enjoying this content, please keep your eyes peeled on our website or our social media for more information about upcoming episodes. And if you want to help us keep the Ghost Light on, please consider making a donation to Boulder Ensemble Theater Company. We certainly appreciate your help. In the meantime, please stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you for the next Ghost Light episode.